How do you feel the food system can improve in Buffalo? <laughs> the food system is mostly busted and broken. You know, you can, most people don't drive. We have a lot of elderly people in our community who can't get to the grocery store. And you know, they have they have Instacart and all of that that will pick up groceries for you, but nobody can pick out your vegetables and your fruit like you do. So I kind of feel like we get substandard fruits um, and vegetables just by me like going out to get my, my green peppers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes you should see me, I'm going to like two or three different stores because they don't look right or they're not or they're too soft or you know they look like they didn't had them for a while it's tough i don't have a car i live in a neighborhood that's still technically redlined um, we have a family dollar that's two streets away other than that we have a um tops market small tops market that's probably about a 20 minute walk each way if i don't get a bus i go out during the week i pick up what i can carry i have bags <laughs> i carry my bag with me everywhere i go okay i live in the shiller park area um and we're not very accessible to fresh food here the closest market is harlem and Walden at the Tops Market, and things are not very always accessible there, fresh uh, vegetables and fruit. Uh, but in the area that I live, it's mostly packaged. You know, my mom is in her 70s, and my mother lives on Delaware, well, in that area. But she can literally like walk across the street to Tops. And my mother will not go to that Tops because their fruits and vegetables has declined so much. I literally go and get my mother and take her to the one that's out Sheridan or something. So, like is it easy for you to get fresh food? No, not easy. I have to, my daughters and my son does most of my shopping now because I'm not able to drive anymore and get out to my favorite food stores and therefore they go to their stores and that's just a food store because there's a lot they don't know about foods that I do because I cooked for my church for 40 years. Oh, well, I have to say one thing. I am blessed. I have always had transportation and I have always taken friends and neighbors to the grocery store because they don't have transportation. I, I, I just wish that um, in all of this, the demographics didn't make a difference in what supermarkets got what. I, you know, just like people should have equal access to medicines and all of that, they should have equal access to good fruits and vegetables too. Larger than access, there needs to be ownership in, in the food, local food system. Um, Again, food is larger than feeding black bodies. I see it as having a direct connection to wealth and legacy. Latisha McNaughton, a young yacht, the new Ganek Ehaga, and you will go from Joda, the new Uguaho, and you will get the Roda, Tuscarora, and go Huene, Nidiwageno, the new Gidio Sororo, the Giro. Um, my name is Latisha McNaughton. I'm a Mohawk Nation. Uh, my family is from Six Nations, and um, my clan is Wolf, from Wolf Clan, and I also said in Mohawk that uh, Tuscar Nation is where I'm from, like where I grew up, where I was raised. And sometime around when I finished the uh, language program, my, my grandmother passed like at the very end of the language program when I was about to graduate. And um, it was a pretty devastating loss because she was like the matriarch of our family. She had 16 children. And so I have a huge family, lots of aunts and uncles. And she was kind of like the glue that sort of held us together, kept us gathering. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so she passed at the end of the program. And I was like, oh, my goodness, how how can I honor her? And I, I just got like really sad, too, because after she passed, um, somebody else had bought the double wide trailer that she was residing in. 
um, which I had considered home for a long time. And uh, so there was this big, empty, gaping lot of like, just exposed dirt from, you know? <laughs> um, and so I was like, how nice would it be to start like a garden on this site and to honor her and like the vision? Because she was one of the few who taught me to appreciate gardening and how it provides for us for food sovereignty, but also nourishes us like in a terms of like connectedness and wellness, right? Um, you know, being close to nature and being able to grow and eat your own tomato. Like, so that was where I was first introduced. So I'm like, yeah, I got, got a very small like project grant to do this. So I got dirt trucked in and I was going to grow this big garden. Do you have gardening experience? It sounds I like do. you do. I do. I really do. My father was a gardener. My grandfather was a gardener. And my father passed at the age of 92. And then when he was 91 years old, he was still setting up gardens, telling me, don't put that there. Put it here. The best sunshine is here. So, yes. You know I what? I was there and when your garden was installed. Absolutely. And I remember you right. um, You grow other things in your garden, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do. Uh, cherry tomatoes and collard greens is our special. I had some yesterday. I served some yesterday. I have we lived on the farm all of my life before I came to Buffalo. Oh, what <laughs> kind of farm? Was Well, we had cotton. We raised cotton. We had our own farm. I always lived on my grandfather's land and my mother's land. And we had our own farm where we raised cotton. And we had gardens. And we raised many veggies. Sometimes my mother would raise enough veggies in the garden to share with other people. You know? Uh, I was born here in Buffalo, but I traveled a lot to the South like at least once or twice a year. Uh, my grandfather, uh, he talked to me about uh, sharecropping. Uh, a &T, was a &T or a &T, Alabama, uh, they actually used to rent some of his land uh, from his farm. But they had a hog farm as well, too. And not a pig, but a hog farm. I remember as a child uh, riding on the hogs, you know, five, six, seven hundred uh, pounds. Uh, just, you know, a whole different experience coming from the city. I remember they would be in the pen and we just, you know, threw rotten potatoes, whatever didn't last on the, uh, 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 in the regular planting season, the, the, the old food, you would throw it into the hogs and throw it into the pen. So it was just an interesting experience that as I got older, I realized how much I'd actually been indoctrinated into it. And my grandfather, I, I think just for experimental sake, uh, he would grow things like uh, corn, uh, popcorn, all kind of stuff would have in a, in a little small space, but he just knew how to make everything grow, even okra. Um, this was in the late um, 70s, I guess you could say. I and called the uh, group that was supposed to be starting this project. Um, they didn't have a slot for me. So I suggested to them that um, I could come up with a night. And it was to start a food cooperative in Buffalo. And it offered families and individuals with a bag of fresh produce. And people really appreciated that because produce has always been a problem in low income areas. I, bought, I got cabbage from you a while ago. I actually got two of them. I cut those down and put them in the freezer. Oh. Now, and, and I pull them out in my greens too. I get a lot of greens and I'll cut them down and I'll put them in the freezer because I'm not cooking them right away. Right. You know, like I could pull out a bag of cabbage now, put it in the pot, let it cook, and it still tastes good. The cabbages you buy at the store, if you don't use them that day, even if you put them in the freezer, it's not right. And you notice the difference. And it's, it's, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Particularly here in Buffalo, we were able to leverage a lot of the work that I've been doing, that the network's been doing, uh, in some very concrete ways in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, working with the faith community, Lincoln Church and other churches in the area to uh, launch food pantries, to uh, improve 
um, networking with people who might be isolated, might be struggling with health conditions, underlying health conditions, who may or may not be tested for COVID-19. And uh, thinking about this, this intersection of poverty, access, you know, other root causes of poor health, like exercise and other things. And, um, you know, before COVID, it was really, really bad. And now it's gotten to be catastrophic. And so I'm really hoping, particularly as we go forward into these winter months, that we can come up with some solutions uh, to help people that are um, food insecure, uh, to uh, be closer together, even as a, a, a food and nutrition community. Uh, eating healthy for me, I feel better, I feel healthier. I feel, uh, also I feel like um, if I preach this, I gotta walk it, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't want anybody see me in the grocery store and say, what? She is not for real, <laughs> you know? So I, um, yeah, I think that that, you know, you gotta walk the talk. I went to a farmer's market um, outside of ECMC and I seen a black woman um, selling organic fruits and vegetables. So just me, how I am organically, when I seen her, I gave thanks and gratitude that for what she was doing and what she was providing and what she was in exemplifying. Because again, I was studying dietetics and um, food is very important and it is medicine to me. Yeah, so, so just, just when I seen that and my appreciation that was evolving for urban farming um, evolved into a relationship with her and that continued to grow and continues to grow today. So fast forward to Juneteenth 2019, the same thing um, with my deep appreciation for um, urban agriculture and that connection to growing your own food. When I seen the agricultural pavilion, again, I was just super hyped, um, genuinely, and again, gave them thanks. That's when I met you. Food sovereignty and food access um, are all relevant to the health of the Black community. So events like that, um, that just is, is there in black spaces and just allows the opportunity for those who are curious or those who are interested, um, I think is very, very important. And it's comforting and inclusive when you see um, people that look like you. And as I was exploring, that allowed me to really see deeper into how potent um, the symbolism is of food um, as far as our historical relationship with food and, and then, journeying into dietetics and my appreciation for food as medicine. Um, I started to eat less processed foods and definitely focus on preparing my own meals. Uh, for natural living, you know, we need a greater relationship with nature and uh and with the earth and and it seems like we're too busy to do that. I, I, food comes from the grocery store, not the ground. <laughs> yes, yes. And I wanted to say, um, this year you plan to include um the whole concept of growing food. And we call it growing for freedom mm -hmm. and and liberation mm -hmm. and self re uh, reliance and resilience. Yes. into Kwanzaa. So do you want to say a little bit about that? Well, we're going to continue the mission. I think that um, the, the whole aspect of relating science and relating relationships, um, being a musician, uh, you know, you being a dancer, uh, we danced all those African songs. We learned the singing and we learned the dancing. Well, now I think that we've come to full circle um, those harvest songs, those planting songs, those things were done because those were real uh, facts of life. And I think that now it is time for us to integrate full culture, not just singing the songs and learning to play the music, but actually doing the work and living the culture. Um, uh, what I didn't say earlier is that my grandparents were farmers. And so I learned at a young age about the soil and the, its healing powers through growing and also just, you know, 
dealing with the soil. And it's just wonderful that uh, so many of us have this heart individually and we collectively have brought all of our talents together. We know that there's been uh, 400 years of association with soil that has been uh, negative because of slavery. And so I see people uh, not taking that out on the soil uh, and uh, coming to better grips with um, their, their history. And I also see, you know, just speaking a little bit about history, that we will embrace our history, not just as black people, but as a country. Uh, I see uh, kind of a Wakanda world um, and uh, our vibranium is gonna be the soil.